everybody, and welcome to this special National MS Education Awareness Month conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, made possible with support from Genentech, Bristol Myers Squid, Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, EMG Serono, Novartis, and Beatrice. This presentation has additional support from Ocrevus. I'm your host, Debbie Foreman, Educational Programs Coordinator for MS Focus, and I'm joined by Dr. Adrian DeBerry, who will be talking to us today about drugs in the pipeline. I'm sorry to say that unfortunately, Dr. Shafis had a medical emergency with his pet and won't be joining us this afternoon. Dr. DeBerry's presentation will open it up. Um, after her presentation, we'll it'll open it up to your questions and comments. So now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker. Adrian DeBerry is a clinical pharmacist at UF Health Jacksonville and is a clinical assistant professor for the University of Florida College of Pharmacy. She received her doctorate of pharmacy from the University of Florida College of Pharmacy in 2012. Upon graduation, she completed two postgraduate residency programs with the second specializing in ambulatory care. She is board certified in ambulatory care pharmacy and certified in specialty pharmacy. Her areas of practice include neurology, pain management, and specialty pharmacy. She has held leadership roles in multiple professional pharmacy organizations and is passionate about patient education. Now, I'm really delighted that you're here, Dr. DeBerry, and thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for that introduction, Deborah, and I'm really happy to see all of you virtually. Um, I think it's been a while since I've done one of these, but thankful that all of you were able to make it out. Uh, go ahead. Oh, I think there might be a delay. Oh, okay, there we go. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So our topic uh, for today will be drugs in the pipeline for treatment within MS. Now there are a lot of different agents that are currently being researched, um, particularly with different types of multiple sclerosis. Uh, this is just a short um, kind of overview of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna begin with going through some of the pathways along the approval process so that you guys can get a better understanding of how pipeline drugs do come to be. And then we're gonna review several drugs that are currently in the pipeline for the treatment of various types of multiple sclerosis. So when we talk about the pathway to approval, it's not a quick process at all. Um, a lot of the times, by the time you see that a drug has had FDA approval, it has gone through a number of hoops and channels to reach that stage. Um, it usually begins with preclinical testing. So that's going to be testing that's occurring in animals and not humans and can take a very long time, depending on what the agent is. Um, particularly if it's an agent that has high risk associated with it, or perhaps they're trying to establish the therapeutic window, meaning the dosing levels that may be safe um, in mammals, not necessarily humans yet. It may take several years during that phase of, of preclinical testing. Phase one, two, and three are the ones you hear the most about um, within the news media. And those are trials that last from several months to several years in duration, depending upon how far along they are within their phasing. For FDA approvals, not everybody makes it to that level. Um, the majority of drugs that have undergone preclinical testing in phase one and phase two are abandoned before they get to uh, the FDA approval process. So only about 25 to 35% progress through to that FDA approval process. And phase four is something you hear about after the drugs are approved. And we'll talk in more detail about each particular phase of clinical testing. But as you can see, it can take 10 years or more for a drug to make it actually out of the pipeline. Oh, sorry, I have a repeat on the slide. 
When we look at the pathway to the drug approval process, um, this is a schematic that the FDA uses to kind of outline some of the differences and nuances between each step. So what you may hear a lot about is a phase one, two, and three, as I mentioned before. Um, on the left, this actually depicts some of the preclinical testing um, that is involved with these agents. So again, it's going to be the animal testing and the gatekeeper, the step from the animal testing to the human testing is something called an IND or an investigational new drug application. This is something that the FDA is gonna review that animal model testing and give the yay or nay as to whether or not the um, specific manufacturer is approved for using testing in humans. Now to the right, the phase one trials usually are the smallest. Um, those have anywhere between 20 to 80 patients. And these are gonna be healthy volunteers. The goal of the phase one testing is really to just determine, are there really any common side effects or things that can be problematic when given to a human? Um, and also making sure that uh, they determine how the drug is being metabolized throughout the body. So they're looking at the liver, they're looking at the chemical concentrations in the bloodstreams, they're looking at the concentrations of the drug in the urine, just to kind of get a feel um, for how the drug behaves when introduced to humans. When we look at phase two data, these are gonna be some of the tests that we're gonna to review today, along with phase three data as well. Um, these are, opened up just a little bit more um, as far as patients that are included in the study. These typically have hundreds of patients that are included, and these tend to be patients that probably have the target condition um, that they're looking for use in this drug. When we look at phase three data, that's really where the FDA pays a lot of attention to whether or not it's effective and useful in the patient population and how the drug performs in a wider scope of patients. Now this slide is also something you don't necessarily always hear about because it involves a lot of paperwork, things um, that can be very interesting to FDA officials or pharmacy regulators, things that are maybe not so interesting to the average citizen. But um, as we look on the left side where it over, does an overview of the FDA review process, um, there's a lot of little things that go into that review process. So the drug sponsors and the FDA representatives have meetings, they review something called the NDA, which is a new drug application. Um, they also will take into account any labeling concerns or recommendations that they have for that drug manufacturer. And then once you know, all of that is done, they'll inspect different facilities and see how the drugs are being manufactured. What is the plan from the particular sponsor and how they're going to get this drug to market? That's all of the NDA review process. To the right side, um, that's depicting more of the post-marketing. So post-marketing is what's considered phase four studies. And these are studies that are looking at what happens when you open up a newly approved drug to a less tightly restricted population. Um, remember in clinical trials, whether it's phase one, two, or three, those patients that are in those studies have been carefully selected. So there may be things that, um, for example, an exclusion criteria or things that are excluded and don't allow a patient to participate in those studies. That's not the case once you have an FDA approval. Um, it opens it up to a wide variety of patients who may have comorbid conditions such as diabetes or um, history of stroke, things that weren't necessarily greatly accounted for in the um, phase one through three studies. So just to kind of make sure we're all on the same page about some of the terminology, I wanted to provide that review for you all. Another thing just to um, kind of lay the groundwork for our talk today is I wanted to review some of the terms used in multiple sclerosis trials. Um, you'll see a lot of abbreviations, particularly the EDSS or the Expanded Disability Scale Scoring System um, is used a lot to kind of um, standardize some of the disability levels across the MS population. So as you can see on the bottom, it does depict the EDSS 
process scale, um, ranging from zero to 10, with the higher the number, meaning the patient has more pronounced disability. Usually you see higher numbers in uh, more advanced stages of multiple sclerosis. This also will be a marker that's used a lot to compare um, for instance, placebo drugs to the pipeline trial drug to determine is it really helping to slow some of the progression of multiple sclerosis in those patients in the trial. Some other terms that are used in MS trials, um, brain atrophy, um, also known as brain shrinkage. So this is basically just referring to the overall mass um, and whether or not they've noticed any loss of brain mass or loss of um, nerve functions and damage, well, due to damage um, within the nervous system. Adverse effects is just the fancier way of saying side effects. Um, these can range from mild to severe, but oftentimes these are included in the phase three studies and the phase two trials um, that are reported that we'll review today. Another term that's used is annualized relapse rates that you may see abbreviated as ARR. This represents the average number of relapses a group of patients can have in one year. And it can actually be calculated from timeframes that are less than a year and extrapolated to what it could be in a year, or it could be um, calculated based off of longer time periods and kind of dwindled down to what the average relapse rate for a one year period would look like for that population. So just a quick question. I'm not sure if you guys have the little reactors on the bottom of your screen, but how many of you guys have heard of the drug Everbrutinib? See if there's anybody in the chats that can type in a Y or, oops, sorry, a Y or an N if you've heard of that medication. So what Everbrutinib is, it's a new pipeline agent um, that's currently being tested in multiple sclerosis. It is an oral treatment agent. Um, we have a slew of oral treatment agents now um, that have been approved over the last decade. So we definitely are having more added to that arsenal. It's a medication that can be dosed once or twice a day and is being studied still in clinical trials to determine what would be that final um, dosing recommendation once it is approved or, or goes for approval. Um, it's in a drug class called Burton's tyro, tyro, oh my goodness, I'm getting jumbled. Burton's tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now, tyrosine kinase inhibitors technically are not a new agent. Um, they're used in other conditions such as chronic lymphocytic leukemia and other oncological dis, uh, disease states. Um, but this particular drug is very selective in the type of target that it targets. Um, within multiple sclerosis. So it's being studied for patients that have relapsing forms of multiple sclerosis, as well as the active secondary progressive MS and is currently in phase three testing. When we look at Burns tyrosine kinase or BTK, it's an enzyme that's found in certain immune cells that plays a role in immune response to antigens. So when I talk about the term antigens, what I'm referring to is invaders. So antigens or um, invaders would be those pathogens or bugs that kind of get in and cause the infection. When we talk about, um, particularly in MS, the dysfunction would be in that our immune cells recognize our own cells as what they perceive to be invaders and the immune system starts to attack our own cells. And that's what causes some of the disruption in the nerve conduction and some of those uh, neurological issues that we see in multiple sclerosis. Now, with respect to BTK, we see that expressed on a number of different cells that are within the immune system. This chart on the bottom kind of gives you a range with the um, cells that are on the left side or high levels of BTK expression, whereas the cells that are on the right side are more lower levels of BTK expression, particularly in B cells. 
um, B cells are, are of the more importance when it comes to talking about BTK inhibitors and why they are useful. So when we talk about B cells, let's think about, well, what do they really even do? So our B cells are actually um, cellular components that are part of our body's own natural defense system. If you take a look at the graphic here, the little blue cells that are listed there are the B cells. And the B cells are very important because they are in charge of um, copying or sending out armies of antibodies. And our antibodies are what really bind to some of those invaders and tag them for neutralization by other components of our immune system. So we have here on the bottom um, left, there's a graphic that kind of shows you the white blood cells, which are the immune cells that we're referring to, and your red blood cells kind of hanging out within the, the vascular system. The graphic in the middle shows that the B cells are really, again, in charge of attacking or tagging those invaders uh, with the antibodies that kind of look like a little Y um, shaped shape there to tag them, to identify them for other aspects of your immune system to get rid of. And I have a little graphic there saying it's a trap. So it basically helps to tag again, those foreign invaders um, and tag them for the rest of the immune system to destroy. Another way to put it, um, a term used in the medical community is an antigen presenting cell. So antigens, again, that's gonna be your invaders or the infection in foreign, foreign um, bodies that are trying to spread the infection or cause problems within your immune system. And I decided to, to make a little graphic um, meme here to kind of give you a better idea of how B cells are are an essential role in that immune process. So on the left, we have our invader cell, or could be a virus, could be a bacteria, um, that thinks it's on a date in the bloodstream and about to multiply as it spreads throughout the bloodstream. On the right, we have our B cells that are secretly pointing out the invaders to the rest of the immune system for elimination. So again, remember those antibodies um, are being produced by those B cells and tagging those invaders and saying, hey, you need to get rid of this. This does not belong. Um, also, your B cells are something that have a long memory. So they're able to almost put a B on the lookout alert on those invaders if they were to ever infect or come back into your body in the future. Now, within MS, those invaders kind of get a little bit mixed up and the B cells get confused and the rest of the immune system gets a little bit confused. And some of them, um, some of them tag the nerve cells or your own cells your body makes or has as foreign invaders. And that's where you see some of that autoimmune dysfunction. So our goal here in using the BTK inhibitors is to try to reduce some of that faulty um, anti antibody tagging within your immune system. So the way that a, of a brutinib works is it stops BTK, which is located here within the B cell diagram over here, and it blocks that BTK from actually acting. So it doesn't participate in the antigen presenting process and it doesn't participate in producing more immune system components that can cause damage. There have been a number of, again, preclinical studies, and now we have our clinical trials that are looking at the use of this BTK inhibitor in multiple sclerosis. Um, particularly the trial I'm going to focus on had a, um, a pretty decent sized population looking at 267 patients with multiple sclerosis. And they compared the BTK inhibitor to both the placebo as well as an active agent dimethylfumarate. When I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of different exclusion and inclusion criteria, I just wanted to include this as a slide as an example. 
Um, it's usually a laundry list of items that you have to meet the requirements on, so to speak, to be included in studies. But when we evaluate them in the medical community, we're trying to gauge whether or not the particular pipeline drug study or clinical trial appears promising in patient subgroups that we see within the medical practice. So we're carefully looking at these criteria and trying to say, does this appropriately match? Does it not? Would this person be a good candidate in the future? Would they not? So looking here at the Evan um, I use this graphic to try to kind of give you an idea of how the time span is for um, the actual treatment and testing and how long these patients were followed. So again, this is an ongoing study um, in the open label extension portion, um, but for the 48 week portion, they have published that data um, and then those findings. So patients were either assigned to the treatment drug arm, which is listed here in the, the red, dimethylfumarate, also known as Tecfidera, or the placebo arm. And, you know, it kind of switched over after the 24-week period if you were in the placebo arm because it, it would make good sense to try to treat a patient on an active medication if you know that the active medication is indeed going to help them. So looking at this graphic, um, we're looking at a couple of things in this patient population. We're checking our MRIs, um, and they're checked every four weeks starting at week 12. And then they're also looking at some of those effectiveness markers. So we're trying to figure out, are the annualized relapse rates decreasing? Is there a change in their disability status over that time period? What's really happening um, side effect wise for our patients? So these are all things that they're taking into account during the active treatment part, as well as the open label extension for this trial. When we look at the phase two results, um, those were reported um, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they did find that there was a statistically significant difference when it comes to development of lesions on the MRI. So if you take a look at the second row there, it kind of compares the placebo, the three treatment arms for the ever Everbrutinib and then the dimethylfumarate on the end. They originally found that there was a statistical significant difference in favor of using Everbrutinib at 75 milligrams as well as twice daily 75 milligrams. Um, but hold on to that thought. Uh, just stick a pause there and we'll talk, come back to circle around on these uh, particular numbers. They also noticed that overall there was a change in the extended disability scale scoring for our patients that were included in the study, and also more in favor, obviously, of receiving treatment versus not treatment. So when we look at some of the, oh, sorry. When we look at some of the adverse effects that are associated with the study, we're looking at different things such as changes in the blood work for patients, if there's any evidence of liver toxicity, are their immune cells going too low? Things of that nature. So when they looked at the adverse effects associated with Everbrutinib, they did find that, of course, the higher the doses you had of the treatment drug, there was an increased um, risk of having more severe changes in your biochemistry or your lab markers, which makes sense. You're putting more drug into your body, you would likely expect that you would have an increase in side effects. As far as serious adverse events that were reported, they still remained under 10% across um, all treatment arms, but we really wanna kind of look at some of those grade three or higher uh, biochemistry values. And again, these are considered more severe um, changes in those markers for patients. When we break down some of these severe adverse effects, it's always good to try to figure out what they were rather than just lump them all together. So this is a listing of some of the side effects that were serious and associated with one, of the, one or more of the treatment arms within the trial. So as you can see here, a lot of them were still reported on placebo, which means they likely had nothing to do with the active comparator or treatment that the patient was receiving since they developed these serious side effects while on placebo. 
However, we want to pay close attention to the toxic hepatitis and the liver enzyme increases. Um, multiple sclerosis agents have been known to cause elevations in some of your liver enzymes, as well as the potential risk for liver toxicity. So that's Another reason why your providers may ask you to get lab, works on, lab work done on a routine basis just to make sure you're safe while you're on these different treatments. But this is something going forward um, as evabrutinib is continued in clinical studies that we'd want to pay attention to. When we look Dr. at some of the... Oh, yes. We had one question on that previous slide that I thought we might want to address while uh, you were talking about it. Why do they include traffic accident? <laughs> so good question. I'm trying to see if I can go back to the previous slide. Okay, so good, good question. So anytime you're enrolled in a treatment uh, or, or a clinical trial and there's something that is either um, a severe outcome for a patient or results in death for a patient, it has to be reported because it occurred during the time frame of your clinical trial. So again, the traffic accident, not more than likely not related to the evabrutinib, but it does have to be reported just as part of clinical trial regulations, even though you would you know, conclude that it wasn't related. Any other questions about that while we're on it? Okay. So some of the other side effects that were, I would say a little less um, severe <laughs> are things that you would kind of expect when taking different medications are listed here. So diarrhea, nausea, headache, things are pretty mild um, for most patients. Uh, the thing that I want to hone into on is the upper respiratory tract infections and the liver enzyme increases. Again, you see this is greater than 10% for the patients that are in the evabrutinib group. So this is definitely an area that is worth watching for in the future clinical studies of the agent. Now I mentioned before that there were some there was um, two subgroups that were identified originally as clinically statistically well statistically significant and changes for our patient population within this trial. However, um, when the study was originally published, there was a bit of a caveat um, to take into consideration when it comes to the statistical analysis of the results. So what they found that is the original statistical analysis, it may have over given benefit to the evabrutinib, particularly in the twice a day, higher dose of the 75 milligram um, twice a day arm. And they found that when they accounted for some of the statistical um, analysis, you, anytime you're doing statistical analysis, you have to account for the fact that the more analysis you do, the more uh, blurry your data could become or your results could become a little bit blurry. So there's a specific analysis that they had to go back and um, make sure that they adjusted for. And they found that particularly in the 75 milligram twice a day group that the benefit or statistical significance was actually not there for that. So going forward, it's known that the 75 milligram once a day is the statistically significant dose. Which you think about it, if you're giving yourself more drug, wouldn't it still be even more effective when you add on additional doses? So that's something to be teased out going forward in a, um, the future studies of evabrutinib, especially as, as well as the open label extension studies. So I'm sure you'll have more about that in the future. We do have um, two studies that are currently recruiting, uh, Evolution RMS-1 and Evolution RMS-2. Um, these are involving evabrutinib and they're anticipating the results that are gonna be due around June, 2023. So again, that's a, lot, it's a little bit ways out, but keep an eye out for more developments on evabrutinib. Another thing to take into consideration is the safety profile. Will they find that the liver risk was was great, wasn't less than once they've uh, been on the treatment more. So we'll find out more data when it comes to the safety side of that medication. So the next drug is called mesitinib. Has anyone heard of this agent? 
in the pipeline. It's also an oral treatment that is used for multiple sclerosis, particularly in the progressive MS side. Um, right now it's, it's tested as a twice daily treatment option and it is in the tyrosine kinase inhibitor class as well. But this one is a little bit more selective, um, particularly where does mesitinib work at? The main focus of its utility in multiple sclerosis is how it impacts the mast cells. Now the mast cells are part of your immune system that help promote inflammation. So mast cells are involved in breaking down some of that blood brain barrier and helping those immune cells kind of cross over to it. Now in MS, we know that there are certain immune cells that are faulty. So the likelihood of having them cross over can do more damage. Um, they also are responsible for recruiting and stimulating T cells that can attack the myelin sheath in MS. So it would behoove us to try to calm down these mast cells and stop them from causing um, damage within the nervous system tissue. So why is mesitinib considered so groundbreaking? Well, it focuses on the mast cells. Um, currently, there's no treatments that are specifically targeted or focused, focused on the mast cells within the immune system. So when you're looking at your immunity, it's, it's um, a, again, another way that we can kind of attack the process that are related to MS. There's just so many different nuances and aspects to it, but this would be the first mast cell inhibitor. So in clinical studies, they looked at the use of this drug in primary progressive and non-active secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, particularly looking at two different doses to try to determine, you know, what is the best route or more effective or um, least side effect wise route for using this drug. And they looked at the 4.5 milligrams per kilogram per day versus the titration up past that to six milligrams per kilogram per day. And they primarily looked at changes in your disability scoring over two years. When we look at the fixed dose group, the results show that 39% increased probability of either improving their EDSS or having um, less worsened EDSS scoring. On the left, it kind of shows you the average or the least square mean change um, of those disability scores over the time period of the trial. Um, they also noted there is a significant reduction in the risk of first disability progression over a time frame of 96 weeks. When we look at the mesitinib safety data, um, it doesn't really show like a huge spike in the percentages of some of the adverse effects um, experienced by patients that are on this particular agent. So it does seem very promising from a safety standpoint. And again, anytime you can get a drug to be very selective about which cells it's targeting for your treatments in MS, because there's a plethora of cells, um, if you can target specific cells that you know have a specific task or a specific function, the likelihood of having collateral side effects is diminished. Same thing with looking at some of the other uh, more serious side effects. 21% um, were experienced in the treatment arm versus 12.9% of having serious non-fatal adverse effects. Um, for this particular trial, I was not able to find the breakdown for what the particular serious adverse effects were to determine whether or not, you know, were half of them, um, the patients were diagnosed with cancer, were half of them an overdose, what was, what did that look like? So I was not able to find that information for the presentation. Um, but in the titration group, they did find that there was no, uh, real statistically significant difference between the treatment arms when titrating. So they've kind of abandoned that um, approach and are focusing more on the set uh, dosing data of the 4.5 milligram per kilogram per dose. Now, when you look at uh, another drug that last week, as of Monday was technically considered a pipeline drug, but as of Friday, it was not. Um, how many of you guys have heard of penicillamide or a newly approved um, treatment agent for multiple sclerosis?
So again, we're adding more of the oral treatments in to our treatment arsenal. Um, this particular drug is gonna follow up under the sphingosine receptor modulator class, which the sphingosine is a mouthful to say sometimes, but we have a lot of agents that are in that drug class, including gelinia, uh, mazent, Saposia. So this would not be a first in class treatment, um, but it is a selective agent. So it does have some differences compared to some of the other uh, sphingosine receptor modulators, which we'll go into. And this drug has actually been approved again for relapsing, remitting, and active secondary and clinically isolated syndrome. Fun fact, um, on the bottom right is a fungus. It's actually called Asaria sinclari. I hope I'm saying that right. And it produces a substance called myriosin. Now myriosin is important because it is actually the agent that fingolamide is derived from. Um, this particular fungus is uh, known to be toxic to cicadas. And they've, while they were studying it, they determined that it had a great deal of immunosuppressive properties. So that's um, how this fungus came to be um, part of our treatment arsenal for MS. Now, when we look at sphingosine receptor modulators, they're really focusing more on um, the different receptor subtypes having different effects. Um, not all of the subtypes are found everywhere within the body and some are found and affect different uh, organ systems or different tissues, not just the immune system um, itself. So particularly looking on the right side, it, it does a breakdown of some of the different types of sinusine receptors um, and where those drugs that are currently approved in the newly approved penicillamide affect um, those particular immune cell components. Um, the lymphocytes help us to recognize those, again, non-self invaders that are traditional like viruses and bacteria. However, in MS, it is jumbled. So sphingosine receptor modulators are affecting a process called lymphocyte egress. And what lymphocyte egress is, if you think about the term egress, it's basically a, 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 a fleeing or a transfer from one area to another area. So sphingosine receptor modulators actually block the um, transfer of those lymphocytes to the external periphery in different areas within the body. So by corralling those lymphocytes, the likelihood of more immune system damage or nerve damage from the immune system is reduced. So it's kind of like having a starting line, but never actually cutting the rope to let your lymphocyte runners run the race throughout your system. And then when we look at some of the roles and locations of the sphingosine receptors, they literally are found some of everywhere. Um, within the vasculature, uh, there are sphingosine receptors that are responsible for generating new vessels and tissue, as well as being involved in some of the transmission of impulses within the heart. So when you're looking at some of these sphingosine receptor modulators like gelinia, that's where you see some of those cardiac side effects come into play because it's related back to these receptors. So selectivity, again, the more selective you can be about a drug and its target and how it helps your disease state, the better usually, it's because you can prevent some of those unwanted effects or collateral damage. So looking at the sphingosine receptor subtypes, there's five different subtypes. And this chart kind of gives you an overview of how some of the drugs are affecting those subtypes. So on the far right, we see the newly approved Pombori only affecting the, the subtype number one for the sphingosine one receptor modulators. Now, the trial that was attributed to the FDA approval for penicillamide is called the Optimum trial, and it compared penicillamide versus teriflutamide. And again, it has a very large um, 
sample size, so over a thousand patients were included in the study, and it was over a long duration um, with the extension trial going up to 240 weeks for patients. And what they found was in the optimum trial that the annualized relapse rates were reduced by about 30 and a half percent over seroflutamide um, for patients that were in the treatment arm. For as far as relapse-free periods during the study, um, a great number of the penicillamide patients, 71% experienced no relapses, so that was great, compared to 61% of the teriflutamide. And then we also look at some of the lesion reduction. So again, the less lesions that you have, um, the less MS activity you have, and the less um, progression you would have there. So looking at those lesion reductions, um, there was over 50% in both cases, where it was T2 weighted or catalinium enhancing lesions. So promising results led to, of course, the FDA approval. Another drug, simvastatin. I'm sure a number of you guys have heard of simvastatin. Um, you may even be on simvastatin. Who knows? It's, it's one of those agents where it's widely used for cholesterol. Um, and the joke in the medical community is you might as well put statins in the water because they <laughs> were discovering that they have a lot of benefits um, for patients. Um, particularly looking at simvastatin, um, it's an older drug. It was originally FDA approved in 1991 and is considered what's called an HG, HMGA co a reductase inhibitor. So again, that's a fancy way of saying statins. It's improved for a number of different uh, cholesterol-related disease states and is very big in the cardiovascular world, um, particularly where we're looking at for benefit in patients with multiple sclerosis of the secondary progressive subtypes. So a little bit of a fun uh, pharmacy fact. So in the late 70s, researchers in the United States were looking at um, this particular fungus on the left, aspergillus, um, and they found that there's a particular substance that they were studying that they found could have benefit in helping lower cholesterol. On the right side is a different type of um, fungus, and they found that this particular substance that was growing um, was studied in Japan at the same time and they found also that it had benefits. Problem is they weren't talking to each other. <laughs> so the researchers on both sides filed patents for these particular agents. And on the left-hand side, that became known as Mevacor uh, or Lovastatin, the substance they discovered. Whereas on the right-hand side, the substance with the exact same chemical structure was also filed for a patent, but received the patent under uh, non-prescription drugs. And this is what is known as red yeast rice. Red yeast rice is available over the counter without a prescription, whereas Mevacor or Lovastatin would require a prescription. Problem is, they're the exact same thing, meaning they can cause the same result, good or bad. So Lovastatin actually contains something called monocholine K. And monocholine K is the exact same thing. Um, it lowers your, your cholesterol levels, but the problem is in the prescription world, it's, it's um, it's checked, so meaning there is a FDA approval process, there's inspections for some of those manufacturers. Uh, what is in the bottle as far as milligrams has to be what's in the bottle as far as milligrams, but on the red yeast rice side, since it's a supplement, it's not really regulated the same as a prescription product. And there's a lot of risk associated with taking something that's not regulated um, as tightly, especially if it can cause side effects. So we'll get into that a little bit on the next slide. But back to how statins work. So statins actually work by lowering your bad cholesterol um, called your LDL. And the way the action, where it actually does the action is within the liver. So by lowering the bad cholesterol, you actually give room also for the good cholesterol to flourish or the HDL. And these statins can lower your bad cholesterol anywhere from 20 to 60%, depending on the different statin. Now, within the particular um, MS community, there's been a couple of trials looking at statins use uh, within MS. So the MS-STAT trial is, is um, one of those studies. 
And it was a two year trial looking at 140 participants with secondary progressive MS. And they really focused on looking at whether or not disability was uh, slowed down um, by use of the simvastatin. They did see that. And they also found that the brain volume loss was less in the patients that had simvastatin on board. There was also a three-year trial that looked at high-dose simvastatin as well, and that's currently recruiting. Uh, the results aren't, aren't anticipated to be published until April 2023, so more to come on that. But what's the connection? Is it really the cholesterol that's um, helping to improve multiple sclerosis, and how does that really work? Uh, there was a study that actually investigated that. It was a computational trial that looked at determining whether or not the benefit seen in those patients that had MS that were on the statin, was it truly from the cholesterol lowering capabilities or was it something else? And what they found was that it was something else. So the lead investigator for the study has a quote here, um, statins are naturally occurring, produced by some fungi, meaning that unlike most drugs that are designed for specific targets, they have, still after two decades of use in heart disease, several unknown effects, and that is why the study is so important. So in the medical community, we call those um, extra effects, pleiotropic effects. So those are benefits that are seen or effects that are seen outside of what your original intent was for the agent. And they, a researcher actually examined that two-year trial, uh, a two-year trial that was done in patients that were using a statin as an add-on therapy for their baseline multiple sclerosis treatment. And they actually found that maybe, just maybe they had looked too soon at those patients to determine a benefit. So eight years after the two years of treatment with the torvastatin as an add-on treatment, they found that the patients that were on a torvastatin just for that snapshot of two years did have a reduced risk of one point increases in their disability scoring scales. Now statin, as I, as I mentioned before, Again, red yeast rice, low statin were the same thing. So side effects can happen with statins and anything that you take, whether it's natural or prescribed product. And some of the common side effects associated with statins are headache, um, muscle aches and pains, and it can have drug interactions um, depending on which particular statin, but you may be on some agents that can cause issues with the statin or the statin can cause an uh, issue with the drug that you're already on. And on the left-hand side, it, it shows you different headlines of patients that had injuries uh, related to use of red yeast rice. So I would always caution patients, please do not buy red yeast rice over the counter as it can be very dangerous um, when not uh, taken appropriately. And then lastly, you guys may have heard uh, on the news about an MS vaccine. That's a very popular discussion um, especially coming on the heels of the COVID vaccine. So BioNTech um, actually produced a vaccine in mice that is similar to the technology used for the COVID vaccine. Now the data that they looked at is strictly in mice. So it's currently in the preclinical trial phases. So not making it to human test subjects yet. And they tested these mice um, after inducing something called experimental autoimmune encephalomyopathy. So this particular um, condition is kind of like MS. So it's abbreviated as EAE, but it's almost like giving the mice um, an injection that triggers them to develop MS-like symptoms and MS-like behaviors. So this is a way that they can test uh, proposed MS treatments ahead of introducing it to humans for safety and efficacy concerns. So how does an mRNA vaccine work? So this slide on the left-hand side depicts the coronavirus uh, vaccine process, but it's a similar technology that's used in the mRNA uh, MS trial. So you basically, provide an mRNA data sequence, which acts like a recipe, and it's injected into the body and absorbed by the cells. And it basically translator teaches the cells to produce a particular protein 
that your antibodies can get used to or learn that this is something that you should or should not attack. So within the MS world, it's proposed that this same technology can be used to try to um, target some of those falsy cells that are within the uh, MS patient population. And what they did find in the trial was that the vaccination did prevent further progression of the EAE or the MS-like symptoms. So again, this is still very early in preclinical testing and it'll be a while before they start to do any human testing. And I wanted to include a section on if you were interested in perhaps um, enrolling in a clinical trial or wanted to learn more about what pipeline drugs are out there, um, clinicaltrials.gov is a very good comprehensive source to kind of just search very quickly on. Um, you can enter your condition, the drug name, if you know it, that you're looking for, and kind of search and it'll show you studies that are open, studies that are completed, studies that are recruiting. Um, basically the whole gamut of clinical research related to the topic. Another place you can look to learn about MS research trials is on msfocus.org. Um, if you select the Get Involved tab and then MS research trials, you can find some resources on there as well. So if you are interested in a clinical trial or possibly being placed on a pipeline drug, there's some things you would want to keep in mind. Um, definitely know the phase of the trial. Is this something that's going to be studied in 20 people or is this something that's going to be studied in 100 people or has it already been studied in hundreds of people and you're just going to be, um, you know, in the pool of a thousand people in a post-marketing trial? Who knows? Take into account there is usually a criteria of eligibility. So not every patient that wants to be in a trial will be included in a trial. Um, there are certain things that are weeded out, whether it be an age range, pregnancy status. Sometimes they're looking for how well a drug performs in people that have more pronounced disability. So some of the patients that may have a lower um, disability scale score, they may not be included in the trial. The locations can also vary. Um, there may be international sites, there may be local sites. I mean, usually there's multiple sites, but sometimes maybe one or two. Uh, and how long is the time commitment? Um, the trials that we reviewed range anywhere from two years to longer. So is this something that you feel like you could stay in? Um, are you in the family planning stages and maybe it's not right for you right now to be? in a clinical study, but maybe later. These are things you wanna take into consideration. And then also study compensation and care. Um, you wanna ask the questions of, well, what happens if I take the investigational agent and I suffer an injury or have an adverse outcome? You wanna know all of that in advance well before um, enrolling within a study. So in summary, MS research and drug development continues to thrive. We have a number of different agents that are in the pipeline or newly approved. And sometimes you'll find some of those older drugs that we use for other conditions uh, being investigated for new conditions. And sometimes they make the cut, sometimes they don't. And some pipeline drugs are just too soon to call. The, the news may sound very enticing and inciting, um, and it's definitely there's a need out there, but some of those studies where they're still in the preclinical stages may be garnering premature excitement until we can fully understand some of the side effects and whether or not it truly does work in, in humans. So I would always caution you to do your own research on the research. Um, did they study your particular type of MS? What are the risks and benefits of the trial if you're considering enrolling one? And you always want to make sure that the benefits always outweigh the risk for you. So that concludes my talk for today. I was trying to make sure it didn't go over time. So it looks like I think we're doing okay. But I will now take any questions that you guys have. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was incredibly informative and and actually easy for at least me, which is difficult usually to <laughs> That was really great. It was easy for me. Um, so I, I'd like to explain, a lot of people already know how to use the chat method, but let me explain for those that don't, if they wanna chat in a question or comment. So uh, let's see, if you have a question or a comment, please use the raise hand feature in the app or send your question via chat. 
To raise your hand, you click the screen to pull up the menu. You select more, which is a little icon with the three dots, and you click raise hand. I'll unmute you, then a button will appear on your screen asking you if you want to allow me to do that. And of course you would say yes. Um, okay, so now let's see. We have some chats from before, so let's go back to some of those questions. We had, um, let's see, let's go way back. We have Paul who said, is the DMF grouping actually Tecfidera or is one of the many generic brands? Um, he's had four different manufacturers of DMF after Big Pharma and insurance will not provide Tecfidera. I'm a little confused as the way it's written and the, and the fillers and are, and are those causing the side effects. Okay, I think I know where he's going with that one. Um, during that particular study, there was no um, generic Tecfidera that was approved or available at that time. So it was the branded product. Um, there are like a slew of generic manufacturers that are available now. And it says you, you had an issue. Okay, yeah, some of the fillers can cause different side effects and reactions for some patients, but that one was the, the branded product that was included in that trial. And Elizabeth, um, I don't remember where you were at the time that you, when she texted this, um, she chatted it, but she said, so then what about other mast cell inhibitors like leukotriene? Does that make sense? Yeah, so there are other mast cell inhibitors. From my research, I did not come across um, any other ones in preparing for this presentation to include for that. But when you're looking at mast cell inhibitors, because they cause a cascade of other functions, there, there could be other agents that are used for that. Okay. I know that April asked, what does overdose mean? And I don't know. Um, so, so that's that was related to like a toxicity or a poisoning. They had labeled it as toxicity or poisoning. Okay, so overdose is overdose. Okay, let's see. Um, someone wanted you to know that they have heard of Ponisimode. So that at least somebody had heard about it. I just found out about it today. Uh, let's see. We have, how about um, do neurologists or MS specialists ever recommend clinical trials? That was something that April asked. Yes, we have recommended a patient's um, consider clinical trials before. I think it's something that we are very selective about when we do because it, it needs to be the right patient. Just because you have a health condition doesn't always mean you're a good candidate for a clinical trial, but typically it may be someone with progressive illness. Maybe they don't have resources that um, to get some of the treatments that are recommended or maybe the treatments that we recommend or think may be a benefit are not approved yet. So there's no way for them to get access to that kind of treatment. But yes, we, we have recommended patients for clinical trials before. It's not something we do regularly though, but we do do it. Okay. David has his hand up. I'm going to unmute him. Dave, there you go. Yeah. Hi, a great presentation. And you gave a lot of agents that I really didn't know about. <laughs> and so my my only question is, are there any updates on the agents that are from remyelination? I've been living with MS now for 24 years. So I would like to know if there's any update. So on the remyelination side, I actually did not look into where we are with some of those agents for this presentation. So I couldn't give you an accurate update on the remyelination piece. Okay. Okay, noted. Thanks, David. No problem. Okay. I do have a question from Robert. 
And he said, besides drugs, what else is in the pipeline? So the vaccine, the mRNA vaccine is what I'd mentioned before. Um, it's kind of not something that you would be taking every day like you would with an oral treatment or on a schedule like a Q6 month um, infusion. So that's kind of that other class there. Um, but as far as any other, were you referring to like diets or I'm not sure exactly what were the non-drug treatments that you were looking at? We'll see if she gives us an answer to that question. But in the meantime, uh, Melissa asked, are we any closer to finding a cure for MS? I would say, honestly, the it's very, it's still very early in the preclinical testing for the mRNA vaccine. Um, but I would say that's probably something that we need to watch going forward. It's still very, very, very early. Thank you. Um, Elizabeth said again, what singular? About, you guys, you see it? Yeah, the thing. Okay, she asked again, what about singular and Lipitor rather than Zocor was mentioned in the last study? Yes, yeah, so they've looked at atorvastatin, um, they've looked at simvastatin. It's not just particularly just simvastatin, they've looked at other statins um, for use in multiple sclerosis, and there's still more data to be done. Um, but yeah, I would anticipate that because simvastatin has so many drug interactions, um, if they were looking at something to get an additional indication or to recommend for patients, it would be something more on the lines of a torvastatin or a pravastatin, just because there's less side effects and drug interactions with those. And then she mentioned singular. So singular has been studied um, within the MS world more so that I've seen with respect to side effects for different medications, um, particularly with dimethyl fumarate or the Tecfidera, looking at some of the GI side effects associated with it. Um, but I did not come across any um, Montelukas focused add-ons or um, just that for treatment um, in the preparation for this one. Okay, Robert said stem cell. And another person also, he said, uh, Tish MS Center phase two trial of stem cell for repair. So yes, there is the, uh, there are studies out there for stem cells. I will say I have seen that there are um, some facilities that may not be as reputable that are advertising stem cell treatment, um, but it is something that could be like a last um, line effort for some patients but again, it has to be the appropriate patient. It's not something that I would just widely recommend or say for everyone. Okay, Mitch wants you to know that um, if you are on one drug and on a newer version, if you are on if I you see. one drug and a newer version comes out, should you switch? Jelenia so sent that happens a lot on the time of, as far as us getting questions about that particular um, area. I would say if you have multiple sclerosis and you are on a treatment and your treatment is being good to you and it is calming down your MS, you are stable, don't rock the boat. If there's an issue where you have um, breakthrough disease or you're having side effects or there's something that's intolerable, you should have that conversation with your provider about whether or not you should switch. Um, but I would say if a treatment is working well for you, you have access to it without any issues, you are responding well, your imaging looks good, I, would, I wouldn't rock the boat. Um, Casey wrote something that I'd like those that aren't checking their chat to, to hear. Um, she was actually referring this to, or answering Robert, but she said there's a brief but interesting update on stem cell treatment in the upcoming issue of the MS Focus magazine. It's gonna hit mailboxes in April and you could subscribe for the free magazine at www.msfocus.org. Thanks, Casey, that was good. Yeah, that's good to know. Yep. Um, Mitch wants you to know, thank you, thank you. After last change and eight plus new lesions and change, um, he's gonna change. He's changed your birth. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand, yeah. Cause I would say don't, if, if you're okay and content and the medicine is 
is working for your your MS keep at it. If it's not working for you, that's when I would say you need to make a switch. But if there's no need to, don't rock the boat because you could risk um, a switch, you know, not not controlling you. Yep. No, actually, he says he's not changing. He won't. <laughs> so, okay. Do we have any other questions? Anybody that'd like to say something? No? Sure. Dr. DeBerry, this is Adam Shafitz, your colleague here. I just hey. wanted to tell you, wonderful job. I'm so sorry that I missed a majority of your presentation, but as always, we can count on you to do the best professional job. You're so valuable to our team. And just so some of the members out there know, um, Dr. DeBerry plays an integral part of our MS team, counseling patients on medications, adverse events, and importantly, working with me in particular to get patients on drugs or switch to a new drug. So she's an invaluable source to an MS center. Her and Dr. Katrina Graham, her colleague. And we appreciate her so much. Thank you, Dr. Schaefitz. We appreciate you too. That was nice. We missed you. We missed you. I'm sorry. And I will make it up. I do promise. One, one thing I wanted to mention about the uh, gentleman's comment about switching to a new drug. Uh, my experience with working with several providers over 13 years is that your provider probably knows best what, what's gonna work for you. And the worst thing is to put a provider in a position to force a change in medication when it is working for you. Um, and when new drugs come out, unfortunately, we have patients that feel the urge to switch drugs. And in many cases, that's probably not the best thing to do if your drug's working, so. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I can tell you. Thank you. That's good advice. Really good advice. I'm glad that you were able to join us. Okay, well, if we don't have any more questions, I'm going to say that that's all the time we have for now. If you missed any part of this conference, it will be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page or our YouTube page. Remember to follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next teleconference will be with Dr. Tyler Brown, who will be talking about positive self-image for the disabled and chronically ill. Now he'll be with us this coming Thursday, three days from now, March 25th at 3.30 p.m. Our sincere thanks to our sponsors again, Genentech, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Sanofi Genzyme, Biogen, EMD Serono, Novartis, Viatris, and Ocrevus, and all of our attendees for your participation, and especially to Dr. Barry. Thank you so very much for the time you spend to prepare and share this information with us. Goodbye, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good afternoon.